Hi, this is Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to my True Crime Podcast. Today is Monday, November 28th, and I am here to give you um, some additional information. Uh, It has been a very interesting time. Mm. In any event, before I get started, please be kind enough to like the video and subscribe because you never know if I'm going to get deplatformed again, right? You just you just never, never know. Um, well, as many of you are aware, uh, after uh, Professor Hamamoto's show of Thanksgiving, and after my podcast, basically just doing a very plain multi-generational uh recitation of the family facts of Whitney Webb all of this has just caused quite a stir quite a controversy and so Whitney Webb finally made a statement uh in response to my podcast and what I alleged I responded and I took several screen images of my response i i went ahead and then sent um put all of those screen images onto my sub stack which i sent to whoever is on my list earlier this morning it's free it's a free newsletter you can go take a look at it and uh, i'll include a link to it below um but however there are a couple of things that i want to discuss not just Whitney's response and what I responded in kind and I'll read those to you but I'm going to uh explain a little bit more about bot accounts trolls I want to give you a behind the scenes look at the publishing world and I want to um just give you a tiny little bit more of information on Whitney's ancestors. So I will uh, begin by saying that um, the bot accounts, and sometimes they're not bot accounts, they are uh, actual people who create at least 100 accounts on various social media platforms. And I know many of you have heard me discuss this previously or read it on my Twitter or read it somewhere because I really try to inform you uh, as to what the bad actors do uh, to suppress information. So some of these are bot accounts and some of these are uh, just uh, fraudulent accounts that are created just to continue to attack someone. And the reason that it is done uh you know it's interesting because someone wrote made a really good um comment about these attacks but basically and while i don't see his comment here um basically it's done when someone is exposing too much and the side that wants to keep the information quiet then begins to attack to discredit so that you the public sort of are distracted from the issue at hand and you think that whoever is delivering this information to you that they do not want you to see or to know is someone who is not worthy of uh, your attention, somebody who becomes discredited, somebody who becomes marginalized. Uh, The attacks uh, were used, for example, against Rose McGowan uh, by Harvey Weinstein via his attorney, David Boyce, who employed the Israeli-based Black Cube. Black Cube is run and staffed by former Mossad agents. And what they did was 
uh, they did it on a multi-platform level. So they not only employed the use of these, uh, I'm just gonna call them for, just to make it easier of these bot accounts, bot troll accounts, they not only used these online to harass, let's say, Rose McGowan, um, the other women who stepped forward with allegations of rape, and also Ronan Farrow and other reporters, frankly, who were exposing this before it became it be, before it blew up um, after Ronan's really great article. Uh, Harvey Weinstein's Army of Spies. So it was employed for Harvey Weinstein by Black Cube. It was also employed by Jeffrey Epstein back in the mid 2000s uh, via his attorney, Alan Dershowitz, who used uh, the MySpace platform to discredit the teenage victims. Ultimately, there are uh, accounts of that in old newspaper, um, no, old newspapers, and I think only from the Miami Herald, who was covering the story at the time. However, even at that point, the victims were not looked upon as victims. They were looked upon as, and they're like little girls, you know, like, Anybody below the age of 18, I consider a little girl. In some cases, these girls were 13, they were 14, they were little girls. And they were called ladies of the evening and you could just substitute the P word that was used to discredit these children. And they were called drug addicts and they were called extortionists. And some of that continued even after Jeffrey Epstein was arrested in 2019 and and frankly this tactic is used by intelligence agencies to discredit anyone who gets too close to the fire this tactic was employed uh and again i'm going to repeat it's not just employed online it's employed in person so to get back just for, for one second to explain what happened to rose mcgowan she had a woman call her, pretend to be interested in her book. The woman was really a spy working for Black Cube who inserted herself into Rose's life to extract information about what she had written in her book. This also happened to several of the victims of the Jeffrey Epstein case. And it's happened to me as long ago as like, in the 19, I would say in the mid to late 1980s when I had uh, people who were planted into my life by my abuser who was part of the cabal and who has knowledge of these tactics before he wired uh, my spaces uh, in order to listen to everything and to keep track of my goings and comings. So these attacks are employed to keep victims from stepping forward and outing very powerful people. And the powerful people who do this are often connected to the world of intelligence. So and this is something that you should always keep uppermost on your mind when you see a lot of, um, a lot of activity around a person, whether they're deplatformed or there's a lot of pushback in trying to silence them. You have to use your judgment. You have to start thinking, why is this happening? You can't just go by what you read because it's going to be a negative comment to make you believe that, oh, well, this person is not worth listening to. So um, I will move on to the the fact that Whitney Webb on Twitter finally responded to the fact that in her original reporting, she didn't cite several sources. Now she only responded by citing one source, not the many other people who actually have come to me whose names I haven't even released because it's, it's not just the names that I have put out there, but it's many other people who she has 
used, according to them, so these are allegations, and not been cited for their contribution to her work. Um, however, she finally responded, and um, I went ahead and I took the opportunity to unblock her because I had always blocked her. I don't read her work because I don't have to. So, for example, just to give you uh, just one tiny, simple thing that I'm sure she writes about, Roy Cohn's trafficking ring. Roy Cohn had a trafficking ring with uh, another man, Louis Rosenthal. Rosenthal was a partner, a business partner of Michelin Rickless. Who is Michelin Rickless? He is the father of my abuser. So I know information firsthand about Roy Cohn's child trafficking ring. And I don't need to read her work. And I don't read anyone's work. I actually tell people all the time, please don't send me information about other people's work because it distracts me. However, I do read the emails I receive from followers whom I trust who say things to me. And I do listen to other researchers who complain to me and say, oh, so-and-so did this or so-and-so did that. And I listen to these things very carefully. So in any event, Whitney Webb writes, a woman named Kirby Summers has apparently convinced Vitrakis. So she means Bob Vitrakis. That's F-I-T-R-A-K-I-S. That I never cited him despite evidence to the contrary. Someone please inform him that this is not the case. I have provably credited his important work extensively, to which I replied, Whitney, how disingenuous of you, more lies. When Bob Fitrakis and I first spoke in 2019, he told me himself that you contacted him and he gave you his hard-earned information. He also told me he was disappointed that you didn't cite him when you began to write about Epstein. Based on what Bob Petrakis told me, I began to tweet this, and apparently you heard me. It was only at this point that you cited his hard work. He received death threats when he began reporting on Jeffrey Epstein and Leslie Wexner in the mid-1990s. I then go on to, you know, I, I did this in a thread, so I then I, I go on to say something that's never happened to you. So she made it clear that she's not afraid for her life when she was on her recent show uh, with Glenn Beck and that she's never received a death threat. So I said something that's never happened to you because she just said it. All right, so then I move on. Moreover, you have harassed me, threatened my life and my livelihood with Johnny Vetmore and all of the fake troll accounts both you both of you have created to do the dirty work on you, your behalf i contacted you first through your publisher who you know wanted to publish my books who then told me he didn't want to get involved and suggested i contact you through your website to get the matter resolved meaning to put an end to the harassment and the, quote, Clinton adjacent, end quote, garbage, fake websites, et cetera, in your attempt to discredit me. I followed Chris Mulligan's advice and sent you an email from your website. I received no response, nothing from you, no help, nothing. Then I realized, oh my God, you're the one, you're behind the attempts to marginalize, marginalize me. Why? Why do I pose such a threat to you? Then in the next screenshot and my response to her of earlier this morning, I write, I am a survivor of the cabal you claim to be exposing. Instead, you engage in an endless harassment campaign against me 
all the while hiding behind the father of your second child. What a cowardly thing to do. The only explanation is that I am a victim of the Ricklesses, who, for reasons that are becoming clear, you are never going to expose. Odd that the day after you were on Glenn Beck's show, he interviewed Benjamin Netanyahu. And for those of you who are not aware, Benjamin Netanyahu was a former prime minister of Israel and is expected to be the new prime minister of Israel. And then I continue in this, my last response to her. And while you corrected yourself and began to credit Bob Fetrakis, that still leaves Ryan Dawson and others unsighted. And so then what I did in the newsletter that I made free on Substack, I included all of those screen images so that you could see for yourself firsthand the communication between myself and Whitney, who only responded now. And then I include in the same newsletter, just, screen, uh, uh, just a quick screen image when I Googled myself and came up with uh, Johnny Vedmore's uh, attacks on me. So I say below is a screen image of some of the attacks against me by Johnny Webb, who identified himself as being the father of Whitney's second child on behalf of Webb. And so apparently he created a couple of, uh, I, I don't know what to call them, pages on his website or other websites called Kirby Your Enthusiasm or I Know What You Did Last Summer is using a play on my name and uh, trying to uh, allege that my work on behalf of the Hurricane Katrina survivors was not legit. Uh, so, you know, that's He's in the UK. How am I going to go after him for slander and libel? In any event, um, he also uh, attempts to say that I am not the person that people think that I am. And he has done something with raccoons, uh, which is, is going to prove to be a little bit on the funny side. Uh, it, it, again, in his attempt to smear me, he has all kinds of ridiculous things. Kirby Summers hates raccoons. And I'll just fill you in uh, on where he got that. I, I I was for a number of years, five years total, the uh, president of the Tenants Association, not just for the building I live in, for but for a thousand buildings because my landlord owns a thousand buildings. So I created a Tenants Association. And... Um, one of the things that I put on the Tenants Association website, because we live, uh, many of the buildings that my landlord owns are close to Central Park in New York City. And the raccoons in the park were um, had rabies. There was a period of time where the raccoons had rabies and they were just oriented and they were leaving the park and biting um, babies and carriages. I live in a neighborhood where there are a lot of uh, children and um, a lot of people would leave their windows open and raccoons were crawling inside and biting babies, and, you know, and some of them died. So I uh, wrote a sort of like a caution, a heads up, keep your windows closed. There, there are raccoons and somehow, and this website, by the way, I removed so how Johnny Vedmore even got a hold of information that was meant to help the Tenants Association members um, is a mystery, but maybe it's not such a big mystery. Maybe they have somebody like David Boys uh, doing all kinds of Black Cube-ish type things. So then I also, um, in my newsletter of today, I included a screen image because I sent Whitney Webb's publisher, Chris Milligan of Trying Day Publishing, who wanted to publish my books, a urgent request when somebody told me that Johnny Vedmore, who 
again, I was told, was the father of Whitney Webb's child, second child, that he was attacking me and that he was being very vicious. And I, you know, so I sent him an email and I'm going to read that email to you because it's, I put the screen image of the email again on my uh, newsletter, which is, you know, which I uploaded this morning on Substack and made it free for you to access. So it's dated January 26, 2022. I sent it at 6.14 a.m. Eastern Time. Chris, the situation with Whitney Webb and Johnny Vetmore has gotten way out of control. Send me a way to contact her or I will have to start an online petition asking people to boycott that book that you're publishing. So the reason I threatened him is because this was my third or fourth attempt to get Chris to send me Whitney's email, which apparently she did not want me to have. She did not want, she was already alerted by Chris a month or two. This went on for, you know, this went on for a while, my attempting to contact Whitney, her evading me. So I had to threaten. I said, send me a con, a con, a way to contact her, or I will have to start an online petition asking people to boycott that book you're publishing. At this moment in time, you are harboring a person who is committing a crime against me, punishable with jail and a fine and open to a lawsuit, namely Whitney Webb. You know, if you cannot go around harassing people, threatening them, making them afraid, you can't do that. That's illegal. That's called stalking. So Whitney Webb was stalking me with Johnny Vedmore, and I needed Chris Mulligan's help, which he didn't want to give me. And I will, by the time I'm finished with this podcast, it will become clearer to you what's going on. I need your help. Please respond immediately. Thank you, Kirby Summers. All right. So her publisher is Trine Day, as you all probably know. Chris Mulligan is her publisher. Professor Hamamoto also used Chris Mulligan to publish his book, Servitures of Empire, uh, which he basically shared with his audience on his show of Thursday, which began this incredible over-the-top response by bots and troll accounts, all of whom are defending Whitney Webb and attacking anyone who dares to question, well, who is she? Nobody knows anything about her. I think people should know who is giving you information. I think people should be transparent. I've all, I've been transparent. When I began to talk about my experience, I'd already written my memoir in 1997. I didn't write that overnight. Okay. So um, I just want to say that uh, Professor Hamamoto, whose name is Daryl Hamamoto, uh, was kind enough to share with me what he what he earned on his publishing deal with Chris Mulligan. Uh, Trying Day sent him a check in the amount of two hundred and fifty dollars each year for about four years, and he said to me, "I did not make even a thousand dollars." So there is no way an independent journalist can make any money, you know, let alone the alleged. 10 million that he talked about on his show that was uh it's it's really i just have to keep going that was said to be what was uh the worth net worth of whitney webb i mean since then we have discovered that she is indeed a very wealthy woman and she's not once disputed the fact that she's a very wealthy woman what she has disputed is the commas in Chile are in the wrong place. But we know that her father is a multimillionaire from the simple 
information that I posted and that I made a podcast about, I don't know, a day or two ago. Um, so just to be clear, Professor Hamamoto is not a pop-up pop pundit. He is a man in his 60s who spent decades as a professor in the Department of Asian Studies, Asian American Studies at the University of California, Davis. He's also the author of many other books. He's been around um, working and absorbing life experiences for over 40 years. He's in his, like, I would think that he's in his mid 60s. This is not a young boy looking for attention. He doesn't need it. He can just retire comfortably in California where the weather is very nice. He doesn't have to uh, trouble himself with a bi-weekly podcast, which I have been following for a long time because he shares very uh, genuine uh, insights that are well-informed by his ex life experience. You know, life experience is worth, well, let's just say that life experience has no price tag because while you can research, if you're a grad student and you're researching for your theses or you're researching for an article or you're just trying to enter and establish yourself as a YouTuber or as a whatever, or, you know, an authority, you're going to just do some basic research online and that's all you're going to regurgitate. But people who have life experience bring something to the table that somebody like Whitney Webb, I'm sorry to say, cannot bring to the table. She is 33 years old and she so she has to acquire this information, some of which is real information but so you know a lot of it is there's there's information that is missing all right so one example which i again i shared in a podcast of several days ago is information let's say on robert maxwell and by the way if you want real information on robert maxwell the the book to read is the one that was written by the two um authors that that Glenn Maxwell's sister Isabel Maxwell wanted to silence and that is um uh, uh, uh Dylan and uh his partner so uh Tom Dylan and his partner who uh him and I followed each other on Twitter and we kind of became friends through an intelligence uh, sort of an intelligence contact that we shared. Uh, and I'm trying to remember his name and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but they wrote Robert Maxwell, Israel's super spy. If you want to know anything about Robert Maxwell, now that that book too doesn't have a, a, all the information, but that book has much better information on the life of Robert Maxwell than anything Whitney Webb can write. So for example, just one tiny example, I only listened to 10 minutes of the interview that Webb had with Glenn Beck. 10 minutes because she made a couple of mistakes, factual mistakes. And I just don't have, I'm somebody, I'm a New Yorker. I don't have patience for sloppy work. I just don't have a lot of patience for a lot of things. You know, I have things to do. I have work to accomplish. And, you know, too much of my time has been taken up by people who want to kill me and people who are stalking me and all of the nonsense that goes on in the Twitter sphere and all of the uh, people that have been paid to harass me on a continual basis. So I don't have time to listen to the whole podcast that she did with a uh, Glenn Beck, because after 10 minutes, I couldn't put up with the inconsistencies of fact. And so to get back to my point, 
when she was talking about Robert Maxwell, she said that Robert Maxwell established himself in New York a couple of years before his death. That's incorrect. Robert Maxwell, according to unclassified FBI files that I was able to access, already had a presence in New York as early as 1953. That's long before Glenn Maxwell ever was ever even born. So I include that in my book, Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, and I include when he began his comings and goings into New York, which was 1953. So I, I just, that's the only inconsistency that I'm going to uh, try to explain in this podcast because I want to move on to the next thing, which is the publisher of Whitney Webb's uh, book. His name is Chris Mulligan. He and I had many conversations. He has all of my work, literally all of my work. And um, when I stopped and I, and I didn't want to do work with him and I didn't want to proceed with him, and perhaps one day I'll get into why I didn't want to proceed with him, although it might become obvious to you when I finish this conversation. Um, he then came to my website and began ordering my books. So he got my memoir, The Billionaire's Woman, and he, you know, and I wanted to know, I even sent him an email, why are you interested in so, in, in so much of my work? And of course, when somebody is looking to just, um, Uh, I, I guess, you know, kind of take a look at who you are. And he's in the meanwhile working on Whitney's wet book, which was only supposed to be one volume and mysteriously became two volumes. He responded by saying, well, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, I was just interested. And so he's never going to tell me the truth. He's never going to tell me the truth. Okay. Well, he also, one of his, his part of his spiel, part of his shtick, is that his father was an OSS CIA officer. And that his father sat him down and told him about what happened in the OSS CIA. And then he alleges because I no longer believe his do-gooder story. I'm sorry. I have to question someone who allows one of his uh, authors to harass the victim of sexual, uh, like not just sexual um, predators, but my life was has been in danger. So I have to question his motives. So... He told me, you know, about his father being CIA OSS and that then he decided to become the publisher of marginalized voices. But I did a little research a year or so ago into who Chris Mulligan is. And his career didn't start out like that. He was selling bootleg, according to him, according to him, he was selling bootleg copies of like videos. Could that explain why Daryl Hamamoto only received, let's just round out the number, $1,000 for his book over the course of four years? Could it be that either Chris Mulligan is sitting on Professor Hamamoto's books and only pushing, let's say, the work of, and I'm going to paraphrase Professor Hamamoto when he calls her one Whitney Webb in quotation marks. Because, like, really, who is Whitney Webb? Who is this, who is this pop-up pundit who's got friends in high places like Joe Rogan? 
who is controlled and told what to do and who is suddenly on Glenn Beck, which is really what made me go and just do a simple analysis of her background when I discovered, oh, she is a um, financially secure woman, multi-generational wealth. And I, I went back uh, as far as 200 years, but then last night I went back even more um, just to, you know, because I, I, I again, I, I'm still trying to make sense of the ongoing lying on her part. It's outright lying for her to suddenly say in her tweet of, I believe yesterday that a woman by the name of Kirby Summers, when she's known about me, people have gone to her and suggested that she and I do a podcast together. And she's never responded to that. So she knows very clearly who I am. Furthermore, Whitney Webb, when I was doing podcasts with Sean Atwood, and, and I was helping him not only because I did three podcasts with him, but I was helping him find, let's call it talent. I was helping him find people to interview. Among these people was were Maria Farmer. I'm the one that convinced Maria Farmer, who did not want to be on Sean Atwood's show, because she claimed that he had to be gay. That that I'm just telling you what happened, because he was in jail and she didn't want to do his show. And I convinced her he is a good guy. And then I convinced Sean, who was already covering the story because he was promoting Virginia Jaffre, and I convinced Sean. Do, do you want to do a podcast with Maria? And I connected Maria to Sean. And I also connected Maria to another two podcasters who have made a killing on their thing, who I will not name. But the initial uh, inter, inter, um, the connections were made by me. So I connected Sean with a lot of other people who were victims of also other predators. And then Whitney Webb, when I contacted Chris Mulligan, contacted Sean Atwood, and Sean co contacted me to tell me that our collaboration is over what's going on with Whitney Webb. I have kept that to myself because I don't like drama. I usually tell people, if you come to my platform with drama, I am going to block you. I don't need to hear anybody's drama. But I think transparency, especially right now when there's so much of the dust has been kicked up in the air, is like you need some disinfectant every now and then to kind of figure out who's who and what's going on. So in the last piece of this um, podcast, I will say that I did a little more digging, not a lot because I don't have a lot of time, but I discovered that Whitney Webb's paternal side uh, were originally from Somerset, England, that they emigrated to, quote, the colonies prior to the American Revolution, that uh, some of the family members had already made their home Pennsylvania, and that um, the family arrived with money from England, from the UK. They already had money because what they, once that, what they did once they settled into Pencil, the, the Pennsylvania area is that uh, they created uh, businesses, and those businesses were uh, the business of tanning. Now, uh, if you don't know what tanning is, um, and he trained, the web men trained their sons, including the, the ancestors of Whitney Webb, meaning her great, 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 great grandfather, trained, was a trained uh, to run a tan yard. Now, a tan yard, is the process of skinning animals to produce leather. So in order to skin an animal, that animal is slaughtered. 
And that is part of the basis of the wealth, multi-generational wealth that Whitney Webb comes from. Over 200 years ago and possibly over 300 years ago, her family, they were slaughtering animals to produce leather. And the only reason I mention this is because Whitney Webb and Johnny Vedmore have been nonstop with the statement that I don't like raccoons. Kirby Summers, the raccoon hater. So I just think it seems a bit ironic. With that, I'm going to wish you a good day. I, I will ask uh, that you refrain from arguing on anyone's podcast comment section because that doesn't get anyone anywhere to be civil to each other to be open-minded to study the facts as much as you can before you buy into somebody's possible agenda okay because what somebody says is not always what they mean. So you have to look behind a statement that's meant to confuse and you have to understand what trolls are and what their purpose is in silencing the victims of very powerful people connected to the governments, multiple governments, because the Epstein and Maxwell story is just a tiny, 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 very shiny tip of the surface under which there's a lot of crime and and it's continued to be perpetrated today and i am a good example of the kind of assaults that continue to present day so again like the video subscribe and thank you so much for your for your support it, it means the world to me all right have a good day bye